WPSU is your source for Penn State sports, Penn State research, Penn State community. But we can't do it without your support. Make a contribution today and get a free DVD of your favorite Penn State show. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Katie O'Toole from the College of Communications, and on behalf of the Faculty Staff Club and our sponsor, the Penn State Bookstore, I'd like to welcome everyone here to our first ever forum at the lovely Mount Nittany Club Room in Beaver Stadium. Welcome also to our listeners on WPSU FM radio and to those who are tuning in via the web. Most of all, a very special welcome to our distinguished guest, Federal Bureau of Investigations Director Robert S. Mueller. Now that we finally have you, we can take you off of our most wanted list. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize our student writer, Michael James. Mike, could you stand up, please? He's a journalism major in the College of Communications, and he'll be writing about today's presentation for the next issue of the faculty staff newsletter. Before we begin today, a brief reminder that our next forum presentation will be one week from today, on November 13th, when our guest is Karen Tandy, who until very recently was a colleague of Director Mueller's. She was the um, administrator of the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency, or DEA. But she has recently moved back to the private sector. Her presentation will be at the Penn Stater, beginning as usual, with lunch at 11.30. And congratulations today to Karen Wilson in Outreach. You are our lucky winner of Lunch for Two at the Faculty Staff Club. Now on your tables, there should be pads and pens that you can use to write down any questions that come to mind today. Your questions will be collected throughout the presentation by Tom Bauer, Peter Dynas, Carol Griffin, and Chris Claremont. Could the four of you please stand so everyone knows who they're looking for? Peter, Chris, Tom, and Carol over here. So look for them, feed their que your questions to them, and then following the presentation, I'll ask as many of those questions as time permits. And one final reminder, given the stature of our guest and the nature of his work, you've undoubtedly noticed the increased security for today's event. So it's a good day to follow all the rules, such as turning off your cell phones and Blackberries. Not just for the courtesy of those around you, but to spare yourself the potential embarrassment of needing to cry out, don't tase me, bro. <laughs> it's now my pleasure to introduce Penn State President, Dr. Graham Spanier. Thank you, Katie. Good afternoon and welcome to all of you. Many of us have grown up with iconic images of the FBI, both real and fictionalized, like black trench coats, dark sunglasses, shoe phones, exploding lipstick, and of course, the FBI's 10 most wanted poster. One day, my daughter Hadley was in kindergarten and we stopped by the post office where she noticed the 10 most wanted poster. She asked me if those were pictures of bad guys. Yes, I told her, they are indeed. She thought for a minute and then said, well, why didn't the FBI hold on to them after they took their pictures? <laughs> Today I'm delighted to have Robert Mueller III here as part of the Penn State Forum Speaker Series. As you can see, we have a sellout crowd, the largest in this year's forum schedule. He is so popular, we had to disallow scalping. <laughs> I know you're all looking forward to Director Mueller's remarks, but first I want to share some of his remarkable background. I've had the opportunity to work with the director and his colleagues over the past few years on national security initiatives. Together with other university presidents, we have worked on a number of crucial issues, including counterterrorism, safeguarding intellectual property, visas and immigration, and today's topic, cybersecurity. Director Mueller became the sixth director of the FBI on September 4th, 2001 
just one week before the terrorist attacks on the United States. Under his direction, the priorities of the FBI have shifted, with the top three priorities focused on counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and cybersecurity. He is one of the exceptional individuals in Washington who has been able to transcend partisan politics to provide leadership during a uniquely challenging period in this nation's history. <clears throat> Prior to his appointment at the FBI, he had a distinguished record of service in the military and in the United States Department of Justice. He earned degrees at Princeton University and New York University before joining the United States Marine Corps as an officer. For his courageous service in Vietnam, he was awarded the Bronze Star, two Navy Commendation Medals, the Purple Heart, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. After the military, he attended the University of Virginia Law School. He then went on to investigate and prosecute major financial fraud, terrorist and public corruption cases, narcotics conspiracies, international money launderers, and complex white-collar crime. He also held key posts in the U.S. Department of Justice, where he oversaw prosecutions, including the conviction of Panama leader Manuel Noriega, the Lockerbie Pan Am 103 bombing case, and the John Gotti mobster <laughs> prosecution. At the time, Gotti was the godfather of the largest mafia family in the nation, which incidentally had none of the charm of the Soprano family. I believe one of the qualities that has made Director Mueller so effective in his many leadership positions is his sincere desire to listen and work cooperatively toward a common goal. As Winston Churchill said, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. I shall take that advice now and turn the podium over to Robert Mueller III. Please join me in giving him a warm Penn State welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, uh, Graham, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, my wife would probably challenge you on this business about listening, I can tell you. <laughs> I also will tell you that I have a badge and a gun ready for your daughter. She obviously is, is one we would want uh, uh, in our ranks. It is indeed an honor for me to be here today, and uh, particularly in this venue that uh, is so wonderful. So many Americans uh, look out on this particular stadium and think fond thoughts of the teams that play here and have a huge amount of respect uh, for the institution uh, that surrounds us here in this, uh, in this venue. Thank you for having me. Two weeks ago, in the middle of the World Series, the Colorado Rockies suffered a denial of service attack in just minutes after tickets went on sale for the Rockies home games against the Red Sox and thousands of fans were unable to buy tickets, fans who were ultimately spared the spectacle of witnessing a clean sweep. <laughs> and I do reference this case because it highlights our dependence on computer technology and the seriousness of the cyber threat. But then again, it also gives me one more excuse to remind everyone that the Red Sox did win the World Series yet again. But today I do want to talk about cyber threats to our national security and what we in the FBI are doing to meet these diverse dangers. A cyber attack could impact our national security as much as other terrorist attacks have in the past. Indeed, the intersection between cybercrime and terrorism is becoming increasingly evident. Cyber criminals and terrorists seek to harm our economy, our infrastructure, and our way of life. And we cannot give them free reign to do so. Our success rests upon partnerships with other law enforcement and intelligence agencies 
and with our partners in academia and the private sector, indeed, with many of you here today. It has been said that the internet, much like Carl Sandburg's fog in, in the poem of the same name, came into our lives on little cat feet, unannounced, too subtle to be noticed at first, and then seemingly overnight impossible to ignore. But unlike Sandberg's fog, which sat silently over the city before moving on, the fog of cyberspace has nearly enveloped us, and it is by no means sitting silently. I recently watched a video on YouTube about the impact of the internet. And before we go any further, I will answer the question everyone under the age of 25 is asking, and that is, yes, those of us over a certain age are allowed access to YouTube. <laughs> and as I understand it, there are many older people, such as myself, who actually contribute to sites such as YouTube and MySpace. And it only goes to prove that senior citizens such as myself, though slow and potentially dangerous behind the wheel, <laughs> can still serve a, a purpose. But according to this video, according to this video entitled, Did You Know? The average 21-year-old has sent and received more than 250,000 emails and instant messages. And more than 70% of the four-year-olds in the United States have used a computer at least once. And finally, internet users query Google nearly three billion times each month. And the internet has changed the way we communicate, learn, and work. It has also become the primary means by which we conduct business, store our data, and connect operating systems, from air traffic control to power grids, but that widespread use has also left us vulnerable to attack. Attack from hostile and foreign powers, from hackers and even terrorists. But I want to start today talking about cyber terrorism because protecting America from terrorist attack is the FBI's highest priority. And to date, terrorists have not successfully used the internet to launch a substantial cyber attack. But there are thousands of extremist websites comprising everything from propaganda to blogs. And in the past six years, Al Qaeda's online presence has become pervasive. For terrorists, the internet has become a marketing tool, a money maker, a training ground, and a virtual town square all in one. In July of this year, three men in Britain were the first to be sentenced to prison for using the internet to incite terrorism. One of these men, Yunus Tasuli, went by the moniker Irhabi 007, which translates in Arabic to terrorists 007. He was a loner living in a London basement apartment with no previous connection to Al Qaeda, and yet he became a key part of its propaganda campaign. It's showing two bars in the battery. Tasuli posted thousands of files on, online from videos of beheadings to detailed instructions for building car bombs. He hacked into servers around the world to gain additional bandwidth. But he did more than merely act as an Al Qaeda webmaster. He was a hub of communication between terrorist plotters in Canada, Denmark, Bosnia, and the United States. He and his colleagues stole thousands of credit card accounts through phishing schemes. And they ran up charges of more than a million dollars for items they thought fellow extremists might need, from night vision goggles to GPS devices. And they laundered money through more than a dozen internet gambling sites. And according to the British authorities, just before his arrest, Tasuli set up a website that he hoped would become the YouTube for terrorists. He called this site You Bomb It. At the time of the rest of his arrest, he was just a 22-year-old student. And today, he is a guest of Belmarsh Prison in the UK. But he is hardly the end of the line. 
many more cyber-savvy extremists hope to carry on where he left off. But the Internet is not only the means by which attacks may be planned and executed, it is also a target in and of itself. Last April, Estonia suffered what has been called a cyber blockade. Wave after wave of data requests from computers around the world shut down banks and emergency phone lines, gas stations, grocery stores, newspapers, television stations, and even the prime minister's office. And all this, although the source of this attack has not been definitively confirmed, the effect was real and left all of us aware of the potential risk we face. How long before others around the world begin to employ similar tactics? But of course, terrorists are not the only ones using the internet for criminal purposes. Far from it. Computer intrusion cases are becoming more commonplace, and studies show that computers in the United States are attacked at a rate 10 times that of other countries. And today, botnets, so-called robot networks of computers that are controlled by hackers, are the weapon of choice. Botnets are considered the Swiss army knives of cybercrime. You name it, they can do it. From attacking networks, sending spam, and collecting data, to infecting computers and injecting spyware. And botworks do not require highly technical skills, and yet the national security implications are broad. A botnet could shut down a power grid, flood an emergency call center with millions of spam messages, or disable a military command post. And odds are that there are more than a few of you here today whose computers may be part of a botnet unbeknownst to you. Indeed, the possibilities are endless, and that is what is so daunting. I want to turn for a moment to discuss counterintelligence, counterintelligence intrusions, and economic espionage. There are no shortage of countries, there is no shortage of countries that seek our information technology, our innovation, our intelligence, information we have spent years and billions of dollars in developing. But the simple truth is, we do not protect cyberspace to the same degree that we protect our physical space. We have, in large part, left open the doors to our business practices, our sensitive data, and our intellectual property. It wasn't so long ago that the espionage game pitted spy versus spy, country versus country. But today our adversaries sit on fiber optic cables and Wi-Fi networks, invisible and undetected. Hackers are using sophisticated techniques to steal sensitive intelligence, scientific research, and communications data. They are difficult to identify and track because they move in and out of international systems at will and they do not leave broken glass behind. A member of our cyber team describes it as having an invisible man in the room, standing over your shoulder, seeing and hearing everything you do, watching every word you type. And you may never know that he is there, who he represents, or what damage he has done. We are concerned not only with the loss of data, but also with the corruption of data, from false information to altered code. Such manipulation can cause electronic dev devices to fail and networks to freeze. It can alter physical environments and laboratories and shut down safety systems in nuclear power stations. And there are also those who seek to block access to our own information for political, financial, or ideological gain. If we lose the internet, we do not simply lose the ability to email or to surf the web. We lose access to our data. We lose our connectivity. We lose our intellectual property. 
we lose our security. And what happens when the so-called invisible man locks us out of our own homes, our own offices, our own information? On the economic front, hackers are stealing vast amounts of information from American companies. Cyber thieves are targeting data at the research and development stage before it becomes classified, when it is much easier to access. And the threat is not limited to hackers on the outside. Insiders present a significant problem. Contractors may take the appropriate security measures, but what about those whom they've some, they have a some subcontract with and their subs? And what of those who may take advantage of open access to research and development facilities on campuses such as Penn State? One recent case underscores this threat. In November of 2001, a man by the name of Lee Soon told FBI agents in Palo Alto that he believed his business partner had stolen trade secrets from his employers. And one week later, Fei Yi, and Ming Zhang were arrested at the San Francisco airport just moments before boarding a flight bound for Shanghai. FBI agents and customs officials seized thousands of proprietary documents and electronic media from two major semiconductor companies. In the following months, investigators examined several hard drives. They reviewed nearly 9,000 pages of documents from companies such as Sun Microsystems, Transmeta, NEC, and Trident. They searched more than 25,000 pages of emails on five separate Yahoo accounts. And these two men, as we learned, had planned to start a semiconductor company in China using this proprietary information. And they had requested funding from a Chinese government program dedicated to acquiring science and technology. And they had received more than $2 million in startup funding from city and provincial Chinese government agencies. Last year in December, these two individuals pled guilty to economic espionage, the first such convictions in this country, and each faces 30 years in prison. Collectively, all of these threats that we've been discussing point or paint a troubling picture, but one we in the FBI must confront. We have the authority to handle these threats from beginning to end. We have cyber squads in each of our 56 field offices now spread across the country. And these agents, intelligence analysts, and computer experts mesh technological expertise with investigative experience. They run complex undercover operations to catch computer hackers and child predators the world over. They investigate threats to both companies and consumers, and they teach their law enforcement counterparts at home and abroad how to work cyber investigations. Our capabilities are strong, but they rely on key partnerships, partnerships with other federal agencies, law enforcement, private industry, academia, and citizens alike. Officers, agents, and IT specialists in our regional computer forensic laboratories find and examine digital evidence from email and cell phone data to documents on hard drives. And together, we continue to break new ground in the investigation and prosecution of cyber criminals. But we cannot and do not limit our operations to the United States. Increasingly, cyber threats originate outside of our borders. And as more people around the world gain access to computer technology and the internet, new dangers will surface. And for this reason, global cooperation is absolutely vital to our success. We now have 60 legal attache offices around the world. And we are working with our partners in Romania and Russia, Poland, Hungary, Italy, and Estonia, amongst others, to investigate international cyber threats. In 2005, by way of an example, FBI agents and analysts worked closely with Microsoft to find those responsible for creating the MyTob and Zotob worms. 
And together with our law enforcement partners overseas, FBI agents arrested the originators in Turkey and in Morocco just two weeks after the attacks were launched. We understand that we must continue to work closely with all of you, members of the private sector and the academic community. In June of this year, we initiated Operation Bot Roast. Yeah, I don't know how we come up with these code names, but Bot Roast is the name of this one. And together with the Department of Justice, the CERT Coordination Center at Carnegie Mellon, private sector companies, and internet service providers, we identified more than one million infected computers and shut down several bot herders. This operation is ongoing and we will continue to pursue these criminals for as long and as far away as is necessary. And I'll tell you, much of our collaboration begins down the road in Pittsburgh at the FBI's Cyber Fusion Center. You can think of the Fusion Center as a hub with spokes that range from federal agencies, software companies, and ISPs, to merchants and members of the financial sector. Industry experts from companies such as Cisco, Bank of America, Target, sit side by side with the FBI, postal inspectors, Federal Trade Commission, and many others sharing information and ideas. And together we have created a neutral space where cyber experts and competitors who might not otherwise collaborate can talk about cyber threats and security breaches. The FBI's InfraGuard program is a more localized example of our private sector partnerships. Members from a host of industries, from computer security to the chemical sector, share information about threats to their own companies in their own communities. And they do so through a secure computer server. To date, there are nearly 21,000 members of InfraGuard, from Fortune 500 companies to small businesses. That amounts to 21,000 partners in our mission to protect America. And we are also reaching out to academia. In 2005, we created the National Security Higher Education Advisory Board, and we asked your president, Graham Spanier, to lead the group. We knew it would not be necessarily an easy sell because of the perceived tension between law enforcement and academia. But once we briefed President Spanier on the national security threats that impact all of you here at Penn State and at other universities, it became clear to all of us why this partnership is so important. Our advisory board provides a forum to discuss issues that affect not just the academic culture, but the country, from campus security and counterterrorism to cybercrime and espionage. Presidents and chancellors from Carnegie Mellon, NYU, University of Washington, Iowa State, to name a few, share their concerns and their collective expertise. We in the FBI fully understand that universities are the creators of knowledge, not merely the disseminators. And it is certainly not our intent to interfere in any way with the academic environment. But we must remain, remain alert to the threats we all face, and we must learn to balance openness with awareness. There is an old saying, that all roads lead to Rome. And in the days of the Roman Empire, roads radiated out from the capital city, spanning more than 52,000 miles. The Romans built these roads to access the vast areas they had conquered. But in the end, these same roads led to Rome's downfall, for they allowed the invaders to march right up to the city gates. The internet has opened up thousands of new roads for each of us. New ideas and information, new sites, new sounds, new people, new places. But the invaders, those whose intent is not enlightenment, but exploitation and extremism, are marching right down those same roads 
to attack us in multiple ways. We stand a much greater chance of staying safe if we stand together. We must continue to safeguard our systems and our data. We must continue to share intelligence. And most importantly, we must continue to stay connected. The enemies, as they say, are at the gates. And we must rely on our agility, our resourcefulness, and our resolve to stop them together. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you very much. Today's off-year election marks the one-year countdown to the 2008 presidential election. Can you tell us who you'd like to see next in the White House? And I, we promise it will never leave this room. Yeah. You say the wor these were screened? <laughs> One of the benefits of my job is it's an apolitical job. And uh, uh, what the FBI stands for is objectivity. Uh, it stands for uh, political independence. Uh, it stands for objective, thorough I investigations. And consequently, one of the benefits of, of this job is I do not have to answer questions such as that. <laughs> you talk of intergovernmental cooperation. How do you collaborate with other government agencies in the effort to combat cybercrime? We have a number of uh, initiatives. I'll talk generally, I guess uh, many people will ask the question of, uh, before September 11th, there was a lack of uh, intersection between CIA, NSA, and the FBI. Um, and that translates to the question also, when we face the cyber threats, uh, what kind of uh, mechanisms do you have for exchange of information? And since September 11th, the walls that had been erected prior to that between intelligence on the one hand and law enforcement on the other had been broken down. The Patriot Act, other uh, decisions from the FISA court. And consequently now, uh, we have many agents who work in the CIA, NSA, uh, uh, Department of Defense, and we have agents from the, uh, and operators and officers from the various intelligence agencies who work with the CIA, or work with the FBI. Uh, uh, my number two person in the national security branch is a, an experienced uh, uh, officer from uh, the CIA. Uh, when it comes to uh, cyber threats, we have a, a task force that has uh, contributions personnel from all of those agencies who have expertise in addressing the cyber threats, DOD quite obviously in the various uh, agencies under DOD, CIA, uh, ourselves, uh, a multitude of agencies who uh, sit together uh, share information, uh, particularly when there is some sort of uh, cyber attack or cyber threat. It can be on uh, DOD, it can be on one of our institutions, or it can be a threat that, uh, against our infrastructure, the banking system, MITOB, ZOTOB, uh, worms such as that, where we pull our expertise and knowledge uh, to uh, thwart such attacks, identify who's who is responsible, and bring them to justice. And while I'm talking about that, I was going to use this occasion to say that a number of you could do very well and be very enthusiastically, enthusiastically welcomed into that, whether it be as an agent of the FBI, which I would recommend number one, but in any one of the other institutions uh, which address uh, cybercrime, amongst others, of the threats that we face. How much does the worldwide feeling about U.S. foreign policy impact the ability of the FBI to work with its worldwide counterparts? I, in the end, very little. Uh, one of the things you recognize, uh, and I talk to my people a lot, and that is the impact of globalization in the sense that uh, if you read Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat, and he talks about globalization as it as it uh, uh, relates to uh, offshoring of industry, uh, finance, and the like. And the fact of the matter in our, uh, is in our business, globalization uh, is as much of a, a problem uh, or a challenge as it is in uh, the financial community or the business community, the manufacturing uh, community. Uh, if you look at cyber threats, uh, I remember 
back in uh, probably around 2000, when we first had the first denial of service attack. I was out in San Francisco at that time, and um, I, the denial of service attack hit the uh, E-Trade, eBay, uh, Yahoo, a number of them, and it turned out being a person responsible was an 18-year-old uh, teenager out of Canada. And since that time, uh, whether it be in the cyber arena or the terrorism arena, you find that uh, the threats that we face uh, cross borders at will. And yet, each of our countries have their own jurisdictions. They have their own judicial systems that have grown up over a number of years. And they are boundaries for us. They are hurdles for us in cooperation. And they are not hurdles. Uh, they are beneficial to the crooks who are trying to escape detection any one of these fragmented, compartmented uh, judicial systems in various countries. Uh, but what you find is the acknowledgement in law enforcement the intelligence arena that we have to exchange information much faster than we did before. Regardless of the politics of this level, if we are to be successful as the head of an intelligence agency, the head of a law enforcement agency, we have to develop uh, relationships with our counterparts. We have to exchange information, not go through the traditional, uh, judicial uh, the framework that we've done it uh, traditionally, but we have to change that uh, information uh, immediately. And consequently, our relationships with our counterparts could not be better at this time, and the political level really doesn't affect us much at all. Could you discuss the issues relating to immigration reform and national security? In other words, how important is immigration reform to preserve our national security? Well, this is a, um, a topic that I generally leave to my good friend, Mike uh, Chertoff, at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it's more in his bailiwick than mine. But uh, we are continuously concerned uh, about terrorists coming in from uh, over the southern borders, but also the northern borders. Uh, people tend to forget. You think about the security issues relating to our southern borders, but Ahmed Razam, Razam back in 2000, uh, uh, a an individual who lived for a period of time in Montreal tried to get into the United States uh, through uh, Seattle. Uh, he was picked up by an alert customs inspector there. He was on his way with explosives to uh, blow up a portion of uh, Los Angeles airport. And so uh, continuously, whether it be ourselves or the Department of Homeland Security, uh, our, uh, understand the threats that come from terrorists, uh, either uh, themselves uh, coming across the border or uh, bringing in materials across, whether it be our southern border or our northern border. And consequently, uh, we are alert to this and we work very cooperatively, uh, cooperatively to, together to address it. The overarching issue of immigration uh, reform has as one of its components the terrorist threat, but I think there are probably far more, uh, there are different aspects of Im immigration reform that uh, are far more problematic and far more of a challenge to get passed in Congress. And in a bit of a follow-up question, has there been an inquiry into the handling of the Minneapolis Musawi incident, and what did the department specifically learn from it? Uh, yes, sir, uh, there have been any number of follow-ups on what happened to Musawi uh, in uh, Minneapolis in the weeks before. Uh, September 11th, there was the Congressional Committee, there was 9-11 Commission, the WMD Commission, uh, Inspector General, GAO, there have been a number of reports on what happened uh, w with respect to that. And again, what happened with Masai was attributable to the wall, the inability of ourselves to be able, agent doing intelligence matters, talk to the agents doing criminal matters. Uh, and what came out of it was the necessity to break down those walls, to have that information pooled not only within the FBI, but between the FBI and the intelligence agencies, so that in pooling that information, you can establish, in this case, probable cause to get a, a search warrant for his computer, which was the principal issue uh, at that time. Why is our satellite imagery freely available to anybody throughout the world via sites such as Green Earth? Or Google Earth, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Google, uh, Google Earth. The, uh, uh, it is very hard to keep technology uh, uh, buttoned up. Uh, if we are not going to do it, some other country is going to. And consequently, you can expect, I would think, that in just about any uh, innovative technology, we can keep for a number of years, but after that, for a variety of reasons, uh, it is going to be out there in the world. I mean, we have tremendous numbers of competitors, and in this globalized world, it is much easier to compete across uh, borders and get the financing you need in order to undertake 
uh, this type of uh, technological advancement in the private sector. And one of the great issues for us, quite obviously, is encryption. There was a great debate several years ago about whether or not you bar encryption development in the United States to prevent those whom you don't want to have encrypted communication, such as terrorists or drug traffickers and the like, taking advantage of encryption. Well, it's uh, well and good if you do it in the United States, but you have 10 or 15 other countries out there who uh, would not uh, uh, feel the same way. And, and uh, the persons who want encryption in their conversations will go to France or, or uh, uh, another technologically advanced, Germany, technologically advanced country to buy that same technology. And so you can keep the technology sequestered for a period of time, but to expect that you're going to keep that technology for any length of time uh, uh, down the road, I think, is, is unlikely. Well, when considering systems that facilitate encrypted communications, are open source software solutions the answer or the problem? Um, that's somebody who definitely ought to go to NSA. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, yeah, yeah. encryption is more in the bailiwick of the uh, uh, of NSA. I, I can't talk about the solutions because uh, they are all classified. This is the way I dodge a question. On, <laughs> they're all classified, but I can tell you, yes, it's a problem. Encryption, uh, encryption is a problem we have to deal with. The proliferation of private organizations requesting social security numbers, does this not place us all at increased identity theft, theft risk? Uh, I, I, this is always the, the uh, challenge of uh, sharing information. Everybody. Uh, says connect the dots, connect the dots, uh, which is, is yeah, you're right. Yeah, but then you are sharing information, you're sharing social security numbers. Uh, yes, the more you share social security numbers, the more you utilize that information in the private sector. Yes, the more opportunity you have to be, uh, to have a computer system hacked into and those numbers stolen. And so there's always a balance to to, to what extent do you wish to share and believe it's important to share information against what are the risks and downsides if you do share that information and it is, uh, it is uh, stolen by uh, somebody in, whom's ha in whose hands you would not like to see that information. With so many of our students posting very personal information on sites like MySpace and Facebook, do you have any words of wisdom or warning for them in terms of how this information could be used against them in their future? Yes. You very quickly in Washington understand that whatever is said or written will quite probably be on the front page of the Washington Post, the New York Times, or in the news the following day. And so you operate with the expectation that, particularly as a public official, and rightfully so, what you say or think will probably be public. The same is true individually. And what you say or think now in this digital age, it's not like a notebook that you share with friends that can go up in your attic and be found by your great-grandchildren a hundred years down the road. Whatever you post today will be available 10, 15, 20 years down the road by an intrepid investigator who wants to pull it out. It is very difficult. You can talk about erasing hard drives, but those in this business know that it is very, very difficult to totally erase a hard drive. And consequently, uh, whatever you put up on the internet, you ought to assume other people are going to see and not necessarily the people you want to see that material. Why are websites that provide bomb building information and the like allowed? Uh, there is a statute that bars it. And to the extent that uh, I, that is out there and is in uh, being published on the uh, internet through the United States, we undertake investigations and have convicted persons for doing that. We do not have any, con we do not have control over ISPs outside the United States. We do not have control over what uh, Americans can see from other countries. And consequently, in this era of globalization, it's one of those areas where coming across our borders can be any number of things, whether it be bomb, uh, bomb building uh, instructions, child pornography, uh, you name it. And uh, we are limited in our jurisdictional reach in terms of addressing and investigating and bringing to justice uh, those individuals who are pushing information across our borders uh, via the internet. It sounds as if we are entirely on the de defense. What can you tell us about offensive reforms against terrorist 
threats? Do we have our own worms and viruses? Uh, again, that's an area that I probably can't get into. <laughs> yeah, you, I, I think you can assume that we're just not standing here. Okay, so it sounds like a yes to me. <laughs> How far have traditional mafia organizations entered the cybercrime arena? The, uh, I would say to a limited extent, uh, you, and it depends on uh, what you would call a organized crime uh, organization now. There are myriad organized criminal uh, organizations now. We're used to thinking as uh, Dr. Spanier said, we're, we're in trance with HBO's, uh, Medanos, is that what it is, I think, or whatever it's called. And, uh, but now we have Albanian organized crime, you have Bulgarian organized crime, you have Russian organized crime, you have Asian organized crime. Uh, we are a country of immigrants, and whenever we come in, we bring in that which we did in the old country as well. And consequently, you have a number of diverse, dispersed, organized criminal groups throughout the United States. Most of the traditional ones engage in extortion, uh, narcotics trafficking, and the like. But there are others that are in uh, that uh, uh, undertake new and, and better ways, criminal ways to uh, gain money. Uh, it can be fraud, and money, many of our fraud schemes that uh, were furthered by paper in the past have now migrated to the internet. And consequently, if you encompass in that definition uh, those fraudulent schemes that are, are now uh, on the internet, then yes, there are organized criminal groups around the country that uh, have engaged in that type of, uh, of uh, uh, cyber activity. The effort spent on the protection of intellectual property could be well served by a concerted, focused international conversation about taking a new view on the concept of intellectual property itself. What role can organizations like the FBI play to help stimulate such a conversation? I'm at a little bit of loss, uh, and I plead my ignorance in, ter ignorance in terms of the conversation that would move the dialogue from our current understanding of intellectual property to some other understanding down the road. I will tell you that we, uh, we fight a, a, a battle on the intellectual property front, particularly with countries like China, uh, to engage them in uh, the war against those who would counterfeit uh, disks or uh, purses or uh, wallets or what have you. Uh, to a certain extent, you can make a dent in it, but not a large dent. I, I do not know, and am not personally familiar with an alternative to our uh, intellectual property statutes and preservation that we currently have that might make our task easier. Certainly, anything uh, redefinition of intellectual property that would satisfy those who produce the intellectual property and those who purchase it, the consumers, that would ease the, the pressure on us and, and our load, I would, I would welcome. Can you comment on net neutrality? Can it remain neutral? Yeah, I probably have to spend some time uh, talking about uh, the definition of net neutrality, but I take it as, as being anybody in, anybody out. Basically, when nobody controls it. Uh, I do not see that changing in, if, you're, if you, uh, you're talking about net neutrality in that way, I do not see it changing in the foreseeable future. We think of the obvious targets for cyber crime, such as banking, finance, and personal information. What threats does cyber terrorism pose to other infrastructures, such as agriculture or the water supply? Well, to the extent that, that uh, computers have uh, are being used, and it can be agriculture in terms of uh, the watering systems. Uh, in agriculture, it could be uh, the uh, a seed company. Uh, it runs by computers, and uh, you could very easily disrupt the uh, uh, labeling, the uh, manufacturer labeling of seeds, for instance, and send out seeds for one thing for one purpose and uh, change the labeling on it and it uh, becomes another uh, uh, and it destroys a number of acres of, uh, of farmland. There are a number of, any place you have a computer is subject to a potential uh, cyber attack. As a country's security is dependent more and more on managing cyberspace, is the race to produce the most and best educated engineers and computer scientists the real key to future security? It's certainly uh, exceptionally important. 
uh, the countries uh, around us are moving a, a light years ahead in terms of developing the expertise and the capability in the cyber arena. I mean, one of the facts that's on the, if you, if you look at this uh, YouTube video, uh, you'll see one of the facts there is that in, I think, 2011, there will be more English speakers in China than there will be in the United States. Uh, that is remarkable. If you look at the facts and figures in terms of development of expertise, whether it be in the cyber arena, the engineering arena, or otherwise, other countries are outstripping us. And so the work that is done in places like uh, Penn State uh, to develop engineers and scientists and, and those who are, uh, can uh, travel and manipulate to a certain extent, uh, that's a wrong word, travel in the cyber arena uh, for the benefit of the country and your uh, future employer uh, are absolutely essential to remain, uh, maintaining our lead in these areas uh, that traditionally over the last 150 uh, years at least uh, where we have led. Lack of cooperation among agencies contributed to 9-11, but even now personal egos seem to stand in the way of sharing information among agencies. How are you addressing this? I, I, I sought to address part of it before when I talked about uh, the breaking down the walls between ourselves and the, and the CIA. Certainly at the top of any one of our agencies, there uh, is an absolute uh, understanding uh, mission uh, to exchange information and work cooperatively together and an understanding that uh, we cannot be uh, successful on ourselves, by ourselves. And I say that as well with regard to our cooperation and partnership with state and local law enforcement. Uh, we have a little bit over 12,000 agents in the FBI. There are over 400,000 state and local law enforcement uh, uh, agents or officers in the country. Uh, we cannot protect the country from terrorist attacks, from cyber attacks, from child pornography, uh, have violent crime by ourselves. We have to do it cooperatively, not only with the federal agencies, but with state and local law enforcement. And our success is dependent on those, on those relationships. But you will always find in any organization, personalities get in the way. And you will have persons who do not buy into that, persons who still believe, as the FBI did 10, 15, or 20 years ago, that the worst thing that can happen to your case is that it be disclosed to somebody in another agency because that person would quite probably try to steal it from you before it was indicted. That was the thinking 10, 15, 20 years ago. And you will still have individuals who think that way. But we have, uh, since September 11th, I think 35% uh, of our uh, workforce uh, has come on board. And consequently, those of us who are, and almost everybody in this room, was seared in one way or another by September 11th understand the mandate uh, to share and work cooperatively together. How do you keep former FBI officials such as Deep Throat from talking to the media on their own? Well, uh, actually he stayed silent for any number of years. <laughs> uh, we really you don't have any uh, a person who wishes to uh, write about their experiences is generally welcome to uh, under the strictures that we have to make certain that uh, we don't disclose any classified information, and, and nor should we inhibit a person's uh, desire to write about their experiences or otherwise engage in uh, First Amendment activity, as I would call it. Uh, the only, uh, the only uh, input we should have is to make certain that uh, in the course of doing it, uh, classified information is not disclosed. Presumably, there are many foreign intelligence agents operating in the United States. Why do we so seldom hear about arrests for espionage? Well, actually, if you do a Google search on arrests for espionage, you'll find a lot of cases out there, uh, and many recent uh, cases. Up in Newark, a case I just uh, indicated in here, although that was uh, somewhat older. Uh, but they don't get a, a great deal of publicity. Uh, the, uh, it's only the, the more I would say not outrageous, but the, uh, for instance, the white collar criminal cases, many of the white collar criminal cases are done, uh, uh, unless they're public corruption cases and like, don't get much uh, uh, interest from the media. And the same is true in, in espionage, unless it's a spy in one of our agencies, whether it be the FBI or CIA, and then it gets a heck of a lot of, of interest. What you'll find is in the trade organizations, you'll have, uh, when we pick up somebody who has uh, stolen uh, proprietary information or uh, has been involved in uh, some uh, espionage, may have been somebody with DOD and the like, you'll get some coverage, but not that much. That's just a fact of life. 
Do FBI agents and CIA agents receive training in the cultural beliefs of our enemies? Yes, uh, absolutely. We have a, a, both a basic course in which uh, a, a number of hours are, are spent on the uh, Islam, uh, the radical elements of Islam, uh, history of Islam, uh, the various manifestations of Islam around the world. Uh, and likewise, we have additional courses after a person graduates from New Agents class uh, that focuses even in more, in more depth on those particular subjects. If you had a wish list of topics for academics to investigate, what topics would be on it? Mm, that's an interesting one. I can think of a couple. Uh, one of the things we've come to realize as an organization is that uh, in the past, we have been a, a somewhat of a reactive, and I would say principally a reactive organization, in that uh, we are known for our investigation after the fact. Uh, we're known for uh, what we do after a bank robbery has occurred, uh, if there's been an Enron or Hell South after the fact. Uh, uh, the uh, terrorists, the terrorist bombings, World Trade Center in 1993 the, uh, uh, in New York City, uh, the coal bombing, the, uh, the uh, attack on the embassies uh, in East Africa, and I believe it was 98. And we have traditionally been known and have a reputation for our investigative capabilities afterwards. As of September 11th, we understand that our responsibility is uh, to prevent terrorist attacks. And so we have shifted to understand that our mindset has to be, we have to prevent the next attack. We'll do a darn good job of doing the investigation afterwards, but the American public expects us to prevent the attack, not just investigate it afterwards. And that requires intelligence. That requires understanding the trends before they happen, and I, it requires us to identify a person who has the motivation and is gaining the material support necessary to undertake a terrorist attack. It's a lot different than what we've done in the past and requires a shift in mentality and expertise. And it's true uh, in the cyber arena. Uh, I would hope that uh, as we meet, uh, talk about the threats in the cyber arena, that those of you who are familiar and work in this area would uh, contribute, whether it be to our fusion center down in uh, Carnegie Mellon or to other mechanisms or uh, groups that we have established to exchange information. That's an area. The other area is also uh, identifying criminal trends, for instance. There's been an uptick in uh, crime, our statistics show, uh, violent crime in the last couple of years. And if you look at that and, and dissect it, you'll see that it's not in all cities, it's in some cities. But identifying uh, what is responsible for that uptick so that we can assure that our resources are going to where they should to address violent crime is an issue of study that we have engaged the National Institute of Sciences on. We're now going through an, uh, another, uh, how do I want to say it, uh, white collar, well, I wouldn't put it that way, but upheaval in the financial arena as a, as a result of subprime mortgages. Uh, in the past, we went through the savings and loan crisis in the early 90s. Uh, we went through the savings and loan crisis, we went through the, uh, the uh, thefts, I will call them accounting thefts, with the Enron Health South uh, Quest. Um, uh, a number of uh, WorldCom uh, in the uh, wake of September 11th, and I only use that as a historical date, but in 2002, 2003, we had upwards of 20 investigations of companies such as Enron and uh, WorldCom in which the losses to the investors in each one of those companies was in excess of a billion dollars. And one of the things we don't spend a lot of time on is uh, we react to the subprime market now. We react to the fraud in, in the wake of uh, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, but uh, those of you who are, uh, look at financial trends and are looking at risks, what is the next, ri next risk? What is the next subprime financial debacle that we will have to face? And if you can answer that for me, then you know, we can try to avert that. Uh, and those are some of the areas that, that uh, we continuously think about. We have time for just one more question, but first I'd like to join you on the podium. On behalf of the Faculty Staff Club and the Penn State Bookstore, I would like to present you with this plaque along with our deepest appreciation for taking time out of your schedule to come here today. I can't tell you how honored we all are to have this personal briefing from the FBI director himself. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you.
And although it seems very inappropriate to mug the director of the FBI, we would like you to have this souvenir of your visit here to Penn State and hope you'll come back again. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. We'll try to get your picture on the wall of a post office. <laughs> <laughs> and our final question. The FBI's official website offers consultation and advice to writers and producers who want to accurately portray the Bureau in their fictional endeavors. To what extent was the FBI involved in the popular Simpsons episode in which a menacing black surveillance van is cleverly disguised as a delivery truck marked FBI, Flowers by Irene? Uh, we thought of it, and uh, we do that day in and day out. And those of you here who join the FBI, you get a badge and a gun and a black van. So, thank you. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you all, and we'll see you next week. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.